airing on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in so-called Asheville, North Carolina. This is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating from Occupy's Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week we spoke with Alex, an anarchist squatter in the Athenian neighborhood of Exarchia. We talk about repression by the New Democracy Party, struggles against greenwashing with wind turbines around Greece, the fires raging through the country, resistance to building a metro station in Exarchia, and the privatization of public spaces like Streffy Park, police presences at universities, anarcho-tourism, and the hunger strike of anarchist prisoner Yanis Mikhailidis. More at L-O-F-O-S-T-R-E-F-I. Dot noblogs.org. Now a couple of announcements. August 23rd to 30th is the International Week of Solidarity with Anarchist Prisoners. The site Solidarity.International has suggestions of ways to get involved, posters for this year, and a place to contact to announce or share your action or event. Separately, on Earth Day 2022, affiliates of Reject Raytheon Asheville performed a rally, march, and direct action at the Bent Creek River Park on block to block traffic and protest the building of a factory by Pratt & Whitney, a subsidiary of aerospace war drone and fighter plane component manufacturer Raytheon. You can support folks as they attend court at 9 a.m. on August 31st, August 31st at the Buncombe County Courthouse, Room 1A, for trespassing charges. You can also learn more about the struggle to push back the murder machine manufacturer Raytheon locally at rejectraytheonavl.com. And another announcement. If you haven't heard, our friends and sponsors at Firestorm Books have purchased a building and will be moving down to 1022 Haywood Ave, the former site of Dr. Dave's Automotive, near the auditorium over the next year. They plan to donate the land to the Asheville Community Land Trust to be held in protection for perpetuity. But they're still fundraising now to pay for remediation and renovation of the space. You can support their efforts and help to make this new space a reality by visiting their Give Butter page, linked in our show notes for the episode, or visiting Give Butter's website and searching Firestorm Books. Here's an update on the Patreon. So I'll keep this short and sweet. I'd like to give a big shout out to the folks who have donated or joined the Patreon recently. We're still not at the level where our recurring donations will cover the monthly cost of our printing, mailing, web hosting, and and transcriptions, which is roughly $600 per month, um, should cover that, let alone saving us to help cover future travels, to gather interviews, replacement equipment, uh, and such. But we're moving in that direction. In order, to, in order to entice you, we've changed up the Patreon to feature a new $3 a month level, a new $3 a month level, and are now offering occasional online Patreon content to that and all other levels, including early releases, behind the scenes chats, updates, and other things. If you can throw us some dough, we'd be much obliged. You can find more at Patreon at patreon.com slash TFSR and learn about other ways to support us monetarily at tfsr.wtf slash support. Hi, my name is uh, Alex. I use uh, they pronouns. I live in uh, Athens, Greece. I'm a squatter and I'm involved in uh, anarchy so and social uh, movements in the neighborhood. So first up, Greece, like many other places in Southern Europe, has faced terrible fires this year, a growing pattern alongside a terrible heat wave. Um, I hope that you've been doing okay with this and I would like, if you could, to talk about climate change and your views on the role of capitalism in this. Have you seen mutual aid projects work to navigate the high temperatures and dangerous air quality where you're at? Mm -hmm. In the center of Athens, we don't experience uh, fires right now. It's um, mostly in some uh, mountains around Athens and in different uh, parts of Greece, in uh, islands, 
But uh, this year, the fires, even if they're very, very big, the media are trying a bit to not show them so much because they want to hide all this uh, very big uh, catastrophe. Last year, it was uh, very important with uh, the fires in Evia Island, which uh, burned a very, very huge amount of uh, forests, like almost uh, one third of the island. And it's the second biggest island in uh, Greece. So it's big. And uh, the fires here has to do a lot with uh, capitalistic projects and money that they they want to uh, use the burned land for different uh, kinds of businesses. Uh, They really don't care about uh, any uh, laws or any natural uh, environment uh, issues. And there are a lot of... uh, ecological struggles in Greece uh, against uh, wind turbines uh, or against uh, mining uh, in different parts of uh, Greece. And of course, uh, it's a big plan. Uh, I think they're experimenting with different capitalistic ways uh, of how they will uh, control and how they will use all of this burned land because we speak about a lot of burned land. In Evia Island, It's uh, unclear how exactly they want to use all of this land. But for sure, uh, what we know, because also the local people, is that when the fire uh, starts, the states don't want to turn it uh, off, turn it out. Um, uh, And this is a a big uh, scandal. Like uh, the state is is, uh, leaving uh, these uh, fires, burn everything and destroy people's... um, land. It's really crazy how it's uh, happening. Yes, uh, I don't know what more specific uh, maybe you would like to hear about uh, all the situation. There is a lot of mutual aid for um, needs of the people uh, or for rescuing animals or for uh, taking out the fires more self- self-organized. And uh, we can see that uh, the people in Evia or in other places and in villages and communities, they turn out uh, the fire uh, themselves. Uh, the states uh, don't care. Firefighters have very precise, they tell them not to, to take out the, the fire. Yes, I don't know if you want something more specific. Yeah. Is the land all private parcels of property or is it state property that once it is or held and held by the state and then once it's destroyed, the state says, well, we can't use this for anything. Let's sell it. So kind of a primitive accumulation option or like how how does that sort of disaster capitalism of buy this like this fire sale thing uh, actually work out for for the states and can you people may be surprised to hear critiques of wind turbines could you share Mm. some of the concerns around those that people have yes the land uh, it can be private property of uh, people that live by agricultural uh, work in in greece still in the smaller towns or in the villages uh, people live by growing stuff uh, or by the forest. They live by the forest with different ways that they uh, use uh, forest material to live out of it in a kind of old-fashioned way, let's say. So with destroying uh, big forests, uh, the state destroys natural environment, animals, and also the way that uh, people can uh, survive and uh, live out of it. So the people are pushed either to go to the cities because they cannot live anymore in a village, in a more natural environment or in more communal environment. Yes, or they are pushed to work in the next uh, businesses that uh, are going to these areas to take profit out of it. It's not very clear what exactly they they want to do. For example, they want to make maybe some more touristic areas out of uh, burned uh, land. Uh, some alternative tourism, some uh, wind turbines or some uh, industries. It's a lot of options what they want to do out of this uh, land, but it's it's very new. It's very uh, fresh, these uh, catastrophes, to know exactly. 
but a lot of big businesses uh, and construction uh, businesses are uh, involved in all this situation. Also, they want to make, they call it the new forest. They want to make new kinds of forests, like less wild, more controlled, more uh, open for uh, tourists that uh, <laughs> cannot go to a real forest. So it's a lot of uh, experiment, I would say, uh, between the Greek state and very big uh, private uh, companies. Uh, so we, we will see how it will uh, turn out. About uh, wind turbines, I know that I have heard from other comrades around the world that this is not really a thing in other countries to struggle against them. But here it's really, really strong uh, struggles uh, against the wind uh, turbines. You can see small islands that they get full of them and it's really, really bad for the local habitants. You can see like places in Greece that it's maybe a small village and on top of the mountain just next to it, you see a lot, a lot, a lot of wind turbines that, uh, of course, the energy that maybe they are producing is not uh, even going back to the local residents. So there's really not any pros uh, on them. Also, these struggles against wind turbines are usually by, by local people uh, that they don't want to uh, see the nature around their uh, villages uh, get full destroyed. They don't want the animals to get uh, kicked out. They don't want the birds to be hurted by the wind turbines. They don't want these very, very big companies to get profit and get full money out of their back. And, and destroy the natural place. And, uh, and I think the more ecological movement uh, in Greece, I think the, the opinion is that wind turbines uh, are not, it, it's uh, like greenwashing, let's say. It's not a real uh, innovation. Uh, it's not something that is uh, helping our class. It's not something that uh, is, uh, it's, it's doing more damage than good. And it's used for uh, for profit and for um, saying, ah, look, we do something good, uh, but we destroy the lives of the locals. And also the wind turbines, the, the places that they decide to put them is um, like uh, places where people live. And uh, also like uh, really natural uh, forests. For example, there was... There was a lot of uh, Natura uh, places in Greece that with a new uh, law of the government, they're not being protected anymore from the state. So uh, amazing natural treasures uh, are not protected anymore and they will be used for uh, profit. For example, you can see the local struggles in uh, Tinos Island or Andros Island. It's uh, really amazing how the, the people there uh, resist and self-organize and how big uh, uh, repression they also get. Yes, I don't know. I think it's, it's very interesting and I think there are also uh, links in English uh, for people to, to read more, uh, also more, uh, uh, you know, good analysis uh, on these uh, topics from, from the people that uh, fight uh, against it. So you're involved in the squatting movement in the Athens neighborhood of Exarchia. As I understand, many listeners will be at least passingly familiar with the context there. But for those who aren't, can you give a brief rundown of the legacy of countercultural and anti-authoritarian struggles in that neighborhood through the dictatorship, uh, its importance in the rebellion since December 2008, in the wake of the murder of Alexis Grigoropoulos and increasing neoliberal austerity since? Mm -hmm. Yes, this neighborhood, the Exarchia neighborhood in the center of Athens, it has always been kind of a center of uh, a political uh, struggle, uh, of uh, a big uh, political spectrum. And uh, it has been a political uh, place even before the dictatorship, but it's too... <laughs> Uh, too old to analyze this. The thing is that this neighborhood is um, 
uh, situated between uh, universities. So it was always has been a place with a lot of uh, young people and artists and, uh, you know, more cultured people. Not really a full working class neighborhood. It's a lie to say it has always been a working class neighborhood. And at the uh, 17th of uh, November 1973, it was uh, a a big revolt uh, at the Polytechnic University that is uh, in uh, in this neighborhood, where the students and uh, workers uh, revolted against uh, the dictatorship here, and uh, this was a really, really, really big uh, event of the Greek, uh, the latest Greek uh, history, with a lot of uh, deaths of students from the military and a um, big uh, fight for, uh, let's say, democracy or um, a lot of things that are uh, more free, let's say, a lot of um, uh, rights of the people were um, won uh, back then after the fall of uh, the dictatorship. Yes, and Polytechnio University has always been a center of uh, struggle for uh, the anarchist movement and leftist movement, a center of uh, riots, a center of organizing, a very lively space of everyday very strong political activities with a lot of other events uh, have happened there, repression, also another murder of at uh, 85 to another 15-year-old comrade from CAPS. Anyway, this this neighborhood has always uh, been somehow a, a center of counterculture, uh, of uh, ideas of uh, the first uh, like squatting movement in in Greece in the 80s and 90s. A lot of things can be said, uh, and that 2008 there was the the murder of uh, the 15-year-old uh, anarchist uh, student Alex Grigoropoulos uh, in the neighborhood from CAPS. And after this, a uh, very big uh, insurrection uh, broke out uh, that's, that started the same night and continued for almost uh, a month in Athens and in whole Greece. In every city there was uh, like a revolt uh, riots and squatting of public spaces and uh, protesting for... It turned out uh, that people were protesting for everything that uh, was uh, repressing them at this time. We can say that this murder was uh, a, fl- a flame, a spark to to start this uh, this flame of uh, the, the people. And yes, the, the Athens and Greece had very big movements also after 2008, uh, 2012, uh, 13 with austerity measures. Yes, and 2008 played a very big role also for for people to organize. Like you can see that uh, a lot of uh, self-organized spaces or groups or political things have started then uh, and have stayed until uh, now, let's say. But for sure, Exarchia neighborhood has been through a lot of phases. It's also very important not to romanticize it. It's very important to give clear image of, of this neighborhood and not to, to make it sound like the, a place of anarchy or a place of uh, utopia. Of course, it's a place with uh, capitalism. It's a place with commercial relations. It's a place with bourgeois people. It's a place... It's, it's a lot of things that, you know, uh, we should not see it as, uh, we should not romanticize it as a neighborhood. Uh, yes, this for, for the past, some, some words for, for the past. So that, I mean, that seems really important that you focus on not romanticizing it and on the commercialism. Like, I know that a few travel guides published in English, when they're talking about Athens, have a section specifically on Exarchia about how experimental and how weird and exciting Exarchia is. You should come and visit and go to these hostels and go to these restaurants and cafes and and what have you. Not unlike uh, Christiania, like up in Northern Europe. Mm. I wonder if you have any, yeah, well, 
It's uh, tourism seems like an issue there, yeah. Uh, yes, right now we have a huge issue with tourism. In the past, it was more alternative tourism or like anarcho tourism, <laughs> where um, you know people would come uh, with the idea of ah, so nice, it has graffitis everywhere, and ah, I can smoke weed here or whatever, or see some riots, uh, which was. It was bad, um, but now we talk about a whole different uh, new level of uh, tourism. Uh, it's uh, really, really commercial. Like uh, the capital has really invested money uh, in Exarchia, uh, and you can see a lot of Airbnbs everywhere popping up. Uh, a lot of people get kicked out of their houses. Like, I don't know, I think the local... Uh, population has been, I don't know, like uh, half of it has uh, left. Uh, people cannot pay rent anymore or whole uh, apartment buildings have been, um, people been kicked out so they can use it, all of it as a hotel or as a hostel. And, and big investors are coming to the neighborhood and a lot of new shops are opening, fancy ones, more hipster, more expensive uh, it's a really, really big issue, the issue of uh, gentrification of the neighborhood, because it's bad by itself, this uh, process of gentrifying uh, in every neighborhood of the world. But here it's uh, one more reason why it's so bad. It's because it's, de it's destroying the main uh, place of uh, political organization. It's not only kicking out some uh, people, is uh, used, gentrification is used as a tool to stop any political action or any uh, resistance from the locals uh, for all the, the new projects that they want to, to build uh, in this neighborhood. Yeah. Can you talk a little, like we, you spoke about some of the history of resistance in the neighborhood and now discussing how it continues to act as a, a sort of core for activity around Athens. I wonder if you could talk about the situation of social spaces, non-legalized housing and squatting around the neighborhood today. And what sort of spaces do you see? Who lives there? What social needs are provided for? And how are they coordinated? I'm hoping to also hear not just about squats, but also social spaces like Streffy Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I don't want to let you down, but uh, there's not really a squatting movement uh, in Athens anymore oh. in the center. Of course, there are squats, in, not uh, only in Exarchia, in, in the whole Athens, and probably there are more than a lot of other places in the world because they're also full illegal. I mean, there, you don't do any process to have a squatting house or a political house, uh, squatting, whatever. But really, the new democracy gover government, when it came on, on power, the first thing they did, uh, or one of the first things they did, is to evict uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of squats. So the this uh, way of organizing through uh, big open squats, it's not existing anymore. I mean, there are squats, there are squads in diff a lot of different neighborhoods where people are organized there, but it's not so big as, as it, it used to be. In the Exarchia, there are a, a few squads left and some and housing squads, not uh, public ones. But I would say it's not the main uh, place of organizing. There are also social centers and social places where people uh, can go and organize. And the main tool of organizing was uh, Polytechnio University. The anarchist movement uh, is uh, working here by doing a lot of open assemblies for different topics. So you need a big open public space where everybody can gather or that can gather also from 50 to 200 people, for example. So universities uh, always were helping in this. But now the Historical Polytechnic University is uh, kind of uh, taken uh, out of our hands. We kind of lost it. Uh, we had there a, a huge building that was the center of, of this open 
assemblies and all this organizing, which uh, they have completely taken it out of, of from us. And it's hard to to gather there. You gather there only in the outside, let's say the university, not in a building. The square of Exarchia is also a, a public space uh, where people uh, can meet. The local cafes can also be, let's say, a place for <laughs> organizing. And uh, the hills, also the the parks, the these public spaces. Uh, for for example, nowadays, because the universities are closed for the summer, all the assemblies are taking place in uh, Strefi Hill because it's a big place. It has a very big amphitheater, open amphitheater, and people can meet there and organize from there. Yes, I don't know what what else more specifically. Yeah, in these sort of assemblies that you're talking about, I mean, people... People may have it's not a part of political culture in the United States where we're based out of to have large assemblies. And my understanding is that there is a history and a continuity of neighborhood assemblies or assemblies that come together in order to discuss or debate specific issues and take action in those areas. How much is that sort of a, an actual thing in Athens political organizing? Is it that people from the whole neighborhood come out or just interested parties or just a political group? It depends on the issue and on the time and it depends on a lot of factors. But th- this uh, open assembly mindset uh, is kind of a tool of the anarchist movement that like historically people had this need to gather together after, let's say, some political event or some oppression uh, after an eviction of a squad, after some some big event that happened, people always had the feeling and the will to meet all together and uh, organize. And like that, you give the chance also to new people and young comrades to join without uh, having to, let's say, meet anyone. Like you can know anyone and and join there and get organized. And yes, this was also a thing of uh, neighborhoods and um, the more mass movements in in Athens. Uh, to me, it's a very important way to, to organize. It's basically what we do, even if we have an assembly of uh, 15 people or 20 people, we would uh, call it openly so anyone can join. And... Yes, for example, when the attack uh, on Strefi Hill happened, when the plans of uh, gentrifying the hill uh, started, uh, the first assembly we did was with, uh, let's say, 300 uh, people, uh, locals uh, from the neighborhood, leftists, anarchists, from some left political parties, from more anarchist people or people from other neighborhoods. Uh, it depends what what happens. If there is a big event, people would gather. Like uh, last week, we did an assembly of, uh, let's say, 120 people uh, last week uh, because of uh, the attack on uh, Exarchia neighborhood. The Final Straw Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Bart, I agree with you in theory. In theory, communism works. In theory. In theory. In theory. So I says to Mabel, I says, oh, hello, I'm Tom. I'm Alicia. And I'm Nate. And we're the hosts of Works in Theory podcast on the Channel Zero Network. Have you ever been in an argument on Twitter and just wished you could drop a devastating David Graeber quote, but hadn't actually read any of his works? Or are you interested in the foundational works of anarchism and communism, but weren't willing to slog through 300 pages of 19th century text? Works in Theory Podcast has done the hard work for you. We read works like Peter Kropotkin's Mutual Aid or David Graeber's Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology and make them accessible through casual conversations. Our whole first season is up now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Search for Works in Theory Podcast. You can subscribe. You can even go ahead and listen to Works in Theory Podcast because... Communism works in theory. So within the wider within the wider project of gentrification in for instance Exarchia it seems like 
Strafe is important because it's a wide open space with an amphitheater, as you say, where people can meet for this purpose or simply to enjoy themselves, be in assembly or just to gather in small groups or picnic or whatever. But also, can you talk about the projects that are slated for um, Strafe Hills specifically and what threatens to to damage that spot? Mm -hmm. Um, It's a very nice hill. It has different parts for different kinds of people. It has a basket for kids and the whole neighborhood gathers there with their kids, uh, with their dogs. It has an open, let's say, rooftop for people to see the view of Athens and have a beer. It has an amphitheater. It has a playground. It has a taverna, let's say, a local restaurant. It has different spots for people to hang out. It's also a place where homeless people can sleep at night. And it's it's very used. It's a very lively place. People can do concerts there, theater, do assemblies, do movie projections. They they can do whatever they like. And it's also a a natural place. There are uh, turtles, a lot of different kinds of birds, cats, a lot of trees. So it, it combines a, lo- a lot of nice things. And also it has been used uh, for organizing, but it has been used also to attack. Like I, I would like to, to say that also, that it's also a strategical point. It's at the top of uh, Exarchia, it's the hill of uh, Exarchia. So strategically it's also a, a very good position. Yes, and... The hill, of course, uh, like a lot of other public spaces uh, in Greece, they're always uh, left out from the municipality. Like they don't pick up the trash, they don't fix uh, the broken lights, they don't, they leave it without water, they close the water of the hill. Like they they neglect it uh, with the purpose to go and say after, ah, look, the hill is so shit, we have to renew it. Uh, but in reality, they left it like that. And we pick up the trash and, and we fix everything. And the plan of the gentrifying the hill, it's it's uh, made by a huge uh, investment uh, company that uh, will adopt the hill. That's what they say. So the plans of gentrifying it is not only made from the municipality of Athens, but is together with uh, private companies that have a lot of business around Exarchia and they sell and, and buy huge buildings. They they take profit out of it. So it, it's like a mafia of the mayor together with these companies and uh, businesses to destroy the place and uh, take money with uh, the way that they want to destroy it. They want to make the hill not like a a free wild space, but a place that uh, can be more familiar with tourists, that the plants, they they will cut trees and plants and will put new ones, more, uh, you know, not natural ones. They want to put uh, cement or other bad material around to make it more, uh, they say accessible, but uh, in reality it will be accessible for uh, uh, good shoes and uh, high heels of uh, tourists. It's, it's a big plan with a lot of different things that they want to destroy in the hill. And we we know, it's, it's very simple to understand that it's a uh, it's bullshit plan. Uh, in the beginning, they wanted to close it also and put cameras and guards. Now they say they will not do it now, this. They took it back, but of course they can uh, do it in a few years. We don't know. And uh, we have seen how they are gentrifying and doing the same works that want to do Strefi. They do it in uh, some other places and we see the result. And it's really not a sustainable result. It's not a result we want we don't want to destroy the whole hill in order for for them to to just make money out of it it will change completely the way that the hill looks and the way that the hill behaves like uh, they will put lights that are uh, from the down to the top uh, like a lot of lot of lights that will create light pollution uh, and will annoy the the animals 
also make it difficult for homeless people to be able to sleep, you know, with all the cameras and the lights and everything, right? Of course, of course. They want also to make an expensive bar there, like expensive restaurant. No, it's a, lo- a lot of things that uh, we are um, uh, opposing. Also, we don't accept anything that is coming from this private company, even if they say it's for our own good. Yes. Can you talk about the metro station that's slated for Exarchia? Like, I know in the past when I've um, when I visited, I've usually like taken a taken a train to the Polytechnic and then walked or taken a bus or something to get over to Exarchia. And I'm sure there's other ways to to get there. But if I was ever going to like Kvox or something like that, and it seems like a massive project to have to open up the street and dig out a huge space, remove whatever happened to be there, and then put in like a huge metro station, connect it to the other stations. It sounds like the project would not only bring a lot of tourists and what have you to the new and business to the new, the newly envisioned Exarchia neighborhood, but in the meantime, it would just further dig out the heart of the neighborhood. Exactly, yes. The plan is uh, they make a new metro line in Athens, which uh, magically is passing from a lot of vital uh, free public spaces of Athens, a lot of uh, squares in in different neighborhoods, uh, working class neighborhoods where migrants or people that cannot afford to go to a bar, they hang out in in the squares. And the... The new metro line is uh, taking over all this public space and it will last, they say, eight years. We know that Greek time, eight years, is at least ten. Yes, uh, all the other uh, metro stations from the, from this new metro line has started to be built up, uh, but in Exarchia is, hasn't started yet because of the resistance of the of the locals from poli- political groups. Yes, it will. Uh, it's a very small uh, square. The metro stations in Greece are, are, are very big. I don't know how it can fit. I think it's uh, nonsense. You cannot fit uh, this big metro station in, in this place. Uh, they will have to remove 70 trees to make this and, yes, kill 70 trees. And then it will not be possible to bring back uh, trees like that because of the the way that they will have built it with uh, cement and stuff and uh, yes it will be noise in the heart of the neighborhood for uh, 10 years it will not have the, this uh, vital uh, space in the middle of the neighborhood and uh, we we know that is uh, not made for the needs of the people to move uh, it's made only to destroy the political uh, uh, characteristics of the neighborhood and to bring uh, commercialization and uh, uh, tourism. But uh, we think that if the metro station comes, uh, it's, it will be a disaster, really. Like, uh, because also it means that uh, cops are also, are also will be more and more in the neighborhood. I just want to mention uh, what happened the last days uh, because it's very now we are in a very very tense situation. Day by day, the metro will start to be being built. They publicly said that uh, during August, uh, metro the metro station and the gentrification of Strefe Hill will start. From Monday, we were guarding uh, the square with uh, sixty people. At uh, Tuesday and yesterday, these two days, a huge army of all kinds of cops came at seven in the morning in Strefi Hill to to bring with them the, with them uh, some of the responsible people of the municipality and from the companies to start uh, seeing uh, how the hill looks like and what they will uh, gentrify and stuff like that. And in order to bring these 10 people to see the hill, they brought an army of cops and they didn't allow anyone to enter the hill uh, in the morning. Uh, but uh, we managed some people to be inside the hill uh, and 
to yell at them and to tell them all our political arguments and to we 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 went with uh, them and the cops we did the big turn of all the hill uh, <laughs> while they were trying to work and we would uh, annoy them and complain and resist uh, i can also send you some uh, videos of, of these things yes please that happened the last days and uh, today uh, they didn't came not in uh, the hill or in uh, the square it's really bad uh, for them what they do also it's really it's it's not acceptable to bring an army of cops and close a hill during a very high heat like people should be able to go somewhere and uh, yes every day we have a lot of events in the hill or in the square uh, we do a lot of assemblies and actions and we we take care of the hill we try to resist even in, in August, August is a dead month in Athens. Everybody is away on the islands. So that's why they came now, because they know uh, that people will not be here uh, to resist. Just because it's so hot, right? Like people take the opportunity to get away to places that are cooler because in a city like that, it at this time of the year in the Mediterranean, it's just boiling, I would imagine, yeah? Yes, and it's uh, everybody on the summer goes to islands for vacation. It's uh, that's how it is, and yes, uh, they know that. So they try to attack now. They they don't do it in a time where the whole neighborhood will be here, or the schools would be open, or even yeah, every, everything. In a few days, everything will turn out. Uh, will, will be a ghost town. Athens would be a ghost town in one week. Yes, that's why they they doing it now. So yes, these days we are organizing a lot. Last week also it was very very tense week. Uh, there was two demos uh, in Exarchia neighborhood. One against uh, a rape incident uh, that happened, and the other one was uh, for the defense of the neighborhood. And in both demos, again, an army of cops came and settled everywhere in every street of the neighborhood and didn't let us uh, protest. We tried to do a demo and break the cops in this uh, feminist demo, but they attacked us uh, two times. So, like, it's crazy. They didn't let a neighborhood demo against uh, rape incidents to happen. And they also attacked fe feminists that were doing that. It's, it's uh, crazy. And the next day also, like, they didn't let us demonstrate. That's their new new tactic. So the repression has been uh, uh, high, has been high the, the last weeks. Uh, also with the hunger strike uh, of uh, anarchist comrade uh, Yanis Mikhail Levis. And I definitely want to ask about Yanis, uh, who, as I understand put a stall at least like sort of paused the hunger strike at a very at a very rough rough time his body was unable yes. to to digest uh water at that point it sounded like from what i was hearing um but to, yes. just while we're on the other subject before we get to yanis with the anti-rape demonstration was the focus of it just a was it against a specific person that's alleged to have committed the rape or was it more of a like there is patriarchy in the society. We are demonstrating against it. Like, let's all be strong and denounce and stop rapes from happening. How? What was the framing of it? There was um, an attempt of rape in the neighborhood. An attempt of rape in a in a small street of the neighborhood uh, during the day, uh, combined with uh, stealing and uh, attacking, and. Uh, as we heard, there are other incidents in the same street of uh, attempts uh, of uh, rape and attacking, probably from the same person. So that was uh, about the the demonstration. Some groups they want to they were uh, combining this uh, incident with uh, the mafia issue. In Exarchia, because the the guy that uh, did the the attack and the attempt of rape, uh, he's um, dealing uh, weed or uh, something like that in a shop by the square. 
So um, some of the groups, they have this thought that the uh, mafia style or uh, this uh, business of uh, selling uh, weed or other drugs uh, in the square can create a patriarchal uh, dynamics. So for, for some protesters, this was also a reason to protest, uh, not only the rape uh, attempt. For me, uh, rapists are uh, a lot, it's, uh, it's beyond that. I mean, there are anarchist rapists, there are uh, family rapists, it's, it's beyond that. To me, it's more like patriarchy is, is everywhere and uh, we should be against it in, in every kind of situation. But but yes, it was more specific about this incident uh, in the neighborhood. But patriarchy is really a big issue in Greece. Uh, the last days, uh, in three days, there were three femicides. It's a huge issue. And the cops again stopped feminism, feminist people to demonstrate against these three femicides. And also it's a, it's a very big issue with rapists that are also part of the new democracy. They're friends of new democracy. They're people with high positions in the government. And they're also pedo rapists that are, have had a very high position in the system of Greece. And lately a lot of them are released, are free. So this makes us uh, very angry and uh, it really like uh, kills us uh, and we we try to to protest against this uh, justice system that is uh, constantly is constantly uh, supporting uh, rapists so when you say that they were released so these were people that were affiliated with the new democracy regime who were incarcerated and who were known to be rapists who new democracy has released right yes or for example the murderer of Alexis Grigoropoulos uh, got released. Uh, or, for example, the murderers of Zaki O, the activist, drag queen uh, activist, uh, they, their murderers uh, were also... Murder in the shop. Yes, um, they got also, also released. Or uh, uh, some rapists uh, that were uh, very high in high economical positions were also released, and some um, uh, actors. Uh, or this guy, the pedo rapist, was the responsible of the national theater in Greece. Like yes. the the head of it. That's okay. Wow. Yes, the head of it. It's a lot of power. Yes. I'd like to also speak about the police and universities under New Democracy, but because you brought up the subject of, of Yanis Mikhailidis, can you speak a bit about his case? And he's tied in with a lot of the things that you've already spoken about, including, you know, the uprisings of 2008 and its aftermath. Um, yeah, if you could talk about his hunger strike and, and how he is now, that would be great. Yes. Uh, so Yanis has been uh, imprisoned around eight, nine years. He has also escaped for, for prison for around uh, one and a half year, but then uh, arrested again at uh, 2019 or 20. He has been uh, accused uh, uh, of uh, robberies and has been arrested also in the past for a lot of uh, anarchist actions, for ecological struggles, uh, for a lot of issues, uh, I would say that he's a, a really, to me, a really strong and important uh, comrade uh, with his speech and his power and that he never gave up. And even when he escaped, he continued uh, the struggle and uh, he has done really, really important things. Yes, so uh, l legally, he should have been allowed to get uh, released from jail because he has uh, done the three-fifths of um, his jail time. So legally, uh, he should have been released. It has been also a lot of months that this could have been possible, but they don't let him go. And legally, he has done a lot of steps uh, and um, for this uh, pro procedure to go on, but they constantly are negative to his uh, demand. 
So, yeah, he decided as uh, the last uh, weapon uh, to use his body uh, to try to win this struggle, not only for him, but also for the other political prisoners and the other prisoners that uh, are uh, in uh, bad situations in the Greek prison. Uh, and also he did this hunger strike in, in order to, uh, let's say, try to move the, the movements and acts more actively uh, in all the social, political, um, uh, other uh, in the other struggles. Yes, and the hunger strike was uh, 67 days. During these days, there have been uh, a lot of uh, actions, a lot of uh, demos, a lot of uh, attacks, a lot of um, interventions uh, to political uh, issues, um, it's it's really it's a, a big struggle. A, a lot of things were were going on, and we were waiting the last decision of the court, uh, like this last uh, stage uh, that could decide uh, on him. And at the sixty sixth day, the decision came out, and it was negative. So this was really uh, enraging uh, for. A big part of the society. Also, uh, if you put together the story of all these rapists and murderers that get uh, released uh, so quickly uh, and so easily, at the same time that uh, this uh, comrade is uh, is dying uh, because of the hunger strike, it's it's even more enraging uh, to see that uh, the justice system is really really uh, corrupted. Yes, the last days he was in a really bad uh, situation, even though the, the movement was uh, growing stronger and stronger and the, the struggle was uh, finally getting more attention because the media was really, really trying to hide it for uh, a long time. And there was big demos and cops uh, were attacking uh, our demos, and uh, but there was, uh, let's say, payback to them. And more and more uh, social parts of the society and uh, more people uh, were taking a, a clear position to support uh, Jans Mikhailidis. But I think the, the whole movements were a bit, uh, a bit too late. Uh, all the support should have started uh, kind of earlier because his situation of health uh, was really turning back very bad. And so, yeah, so he was denied release or he's being denied release so far under an argument by the judge that it's like preventative custody, right? Because they say yes. he'll go back and do the same things that put him into prison in the first place. And as you say, but they're fine releasing people who have a history of rape as if like robbing, robbing a bank versus raping someone are like comparable things somehow. And in terms of the, um, the wider movement and activating, uh, the po like political bases and movements last year, there was the hunger strike that actually lasted for 66 days also of, um, Dimitris Kufadinis, which also brought huge amounts of people out into the streets. Right. So there's this kind of culture, in Greece, political culture where people support their prisoners in a very active way, in a way that I find really inspiring and I don't see, have not seen in a very long time in the United States. But yeah, that's that's too bad that it didn't it didn't get the people out there when they needed to be. Is he he's just sort of like putting it on pause for the moment, but maybe will recommence it? Yes, uh, I don't really know what this uh, can mean because uh, in his. Uh announcement there was uh, some vague parts uh, of uh, he said he cannot really explain why he stops uh, or he puts on pause uh, the hunger strike uh, so i guess we will uh, see we will find out uh, but yeah I'm, he said it's on pause uh, i don't really i don't know uh, what this uh, mean or uh, pause until when i i, I don't know but I think for sure it means that the, the struggle for his uh, liberation is, is not over, uh, for sure. 
So would you speak about the position of police in relation to universities, the role of these spaces for debate? You've already sort of talked about how the, the polytechnic and closing the building was annoying to the least to like assemblies that would have been using the space who now have to do it outside. But allowing police onto campuses is a relatively new technique allowable or that the government has been taking that has sort of been off of the books for a number of decades because of the memories of the dictatorship and the murders in Exarchia uh, and elsewhere. Can you talk a bit about the role of the university as a as a public space, not just as like a private space that people who pay to go to it, like a private university in the United States would experience, and sort of what motivations of new democracy in this? Yes. The universities in, in Greece are public, there are also some, there are private ones, but they don't have this um, same situation, let's say. So public universities are also kind of uh, accessible for a lot of uh, people to attend. And let's say there are a lot of student rights that have been won through the very strong uh, movements uh, and after the fall of dictatorship. And one of the rights that uh, we had is called the university asylum. Is um, let's say a law that uh, is not allowing the presence of uh, police inside the universities. Uh, of course, this law has been changed a lot of times. It's uh, it's complicated. I don't even remember to explain all of these uh, changes that has happened all these years. But uh, I say this to to say that cops were entering, uh, but sometimes, like in extreme times, let's say, or something very bad, <laughs> like someone's being attacked or something like that. I need to go in and resolve this sort of thing. N- not really. This is not uh, enough. <laughs> It's a political decision uh, to put caps uh, to stop something in a university. But uh, in general, universities were were used uh, for um, attacking the caps as a, a place that caps couldn't enter. So you could uh, use them as a place to to attack the caps or to to hide or to start uh, riots from there or to to squat it. The the university movements have been uh, also very huge in the past. There have been, uh, yeah, gr- great movements like uh, 2006 or 2007. So the Greek university, it's a very political space. The leftists, like uh, more communist and Leninist uh, uh, people and political parties, they also have like a uh, big uh, power and influence in the universities. And let's say every university uh, has um, a lot of lefties, uh, people from the Communist Party, and I would say at least one uh, uh, squatted uh, place for a more uh, self-organized organization and more uh, anarchist uh, uh, ideas. And also the main events, the assemblies, the parties, the raves, the concerts, the events, uh, festivals, everything would uh, take space there in almost all, all of the universities in, in Athens and in Thessaloniki, of course, and in, in every city that there is uh, some movement or some students, there is a, the universities are active. So it is a very public space also because the university campuses, some of them are very big and people just uh, go there and play and have fun or people of the neighborhoods are also using these big campuses. It's a yes, are very social and public uh, spaces. Yes, so the asylum, uh, this uh, let's say, so I would say it's a social uh, contract. Like if the society's opinion would uh, allow cops to enter, the cops would enter. So yes, um, all these years, of course, cops. Uh, have entered a lot of times in the universities, but uh, I would say it's um, it's a shame for them to enter. Uh, it's not good uh, politically for the government. But the propaganda also from Syriza government was very tense on uh, the against the criminality of uh, universities. 
against the rioters that destroy everything and they squat the university all the time and the university is not normal, uh, that there is uh, criminality and uh, drug dealing and um, a lot of things. Uh, so Syriza government created this image of uh, how bad the Greek university is. So when new democracy uh, came on power, the first thing they did uh, was to uh, stop the university asylum from, like, from the law, to, to stop it from existing. Of course, this, um, as I said before, has a lot to do with uh, social acceptance. Yes, so it's not that the cops in Athens entered the university all the time. I would say this year they entered in universities around uh, like three times uh, in Athens or four, I don't know, this year. But uh, in Thessaloniki is way, way more tense. Uh, in Thessaloniki, the, the second uh, biggest city of, of uh, Greece. Um, also, the yeah, the government is planning uh, this university police, a special police uh, force that will be only in the universities and guard them. This hasn't been yet in uh, there have been big struggles against it. It hasn't yet been uh, made. Also, the law says about um, cameras and uh, to check your uh, ID before you enter the university. And all this goes together with uh, a kind of privatization of the public uh, education, which has a, lo a lot of parts in it. And it contains a lot of uh, money for the, for the government to make uh, universities uh, as a business. So basically they want to stop the resistance and the organizing that happens in universities for the students and for the rest of the movements. And they, they want to stop it in any any possible way. Yeah. It's worth noting that, I mean, Syriza was quote-unquote center-left party that was touted by a lot of progressives and leftists in the West. And... Also, that new democracy, right, was the was just sort of a reformulation of a lot of the leadership that was around during the dictatorship and that ruled for a long time after the, the fall of the dictatorship, right? Yes, it is, um, was, uh, let's say, left-wing uh, government that uh, popped out because of the mass uh, movements that emerged in, in Greece. But, of course, uh, we are not, uh, we don't have let's say, any hope on this government. Of course, it it was uh, very bad in, in a lot of uh, ways and they did uh, a lot of repression to to squads and to people and uh, to migrants. And um, of course, they are... It's very important to note that, uh, that the leftist uh, government uh, didn't mean um, haven or something. Yeah. I don't know, utopia or... So how can anarchists and anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalists support the resistance to gentrification in Exarchia from far away? Like, I, and are, I mean, because a lot, a lot, like, definitely the city that I live in, the struggles look different, but a lot of the components are similar in terms of Airbnb or Verbo or these other pri further privatization or monetization of, of spaces and the pressure that those put on the government here to make the town less about the people that live here, but more for the investors and for the people that are here for a weekend to get drunk and, and crazy. So there's a lot of commonalities and maybe there's ways that people in solidarity can strike locally and, and help, help support the struggle in Exarchia. And are there, for those people that are traveling, are there better ways for them to visit Athens or Exarchia or what would be a better approach than just trying to get a hotel room or, or an Airbnb? I would say that uh, maybe I'm a bit harsh, but if somebody wants to come to Exarchia or Athens for, for a week, not to come, really. Like, uh, if people don't want to come uh, to join the struggle and be here with us, I don't see a reason for them to come. We are really open to international comrades. Uh, we have a lot of uh, international comrades that um, 
are staying in, in Athens. You know, it's not only about like localism or uh, some sort of uh, hatred towards uh, other people. It's really that uh, if you come here for a, for a week, uh, for a weekend, people usually, uh, even if they have a good uh, will, they don't have other solutions than either to stay in, in Airbnbs or hostels and or to, to pay expensive shit and to fill the streets with... I don't know, it, it's kind of weird because uh, sometimes we feel like we're in a zoo, like a lot of people are just coming here to see us like they don't participate they are just curious and they just uh, are watching us to do all this stuff and it's kind of an amusement for for a lot of people what we do and we really really try to explain that uh, it's not a uh, fun it's not amusement it's not you should not be curious to watch what we do here if you want you can come and join our struggle here and uh, contact the local assemblies and uh, yeah, somebody can host you or somebody can, you know, we can find a way if people want to support the, the struggle. There are ways for people to come and join and uh, yeah, but uh, if people just want to come and uh, have fun, we, we don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. And so to me, if you're abroad, a good uh, tactic is to say to your friends, uh, don't go there. If you don't go there to struggle, don't go there to consume. Don't go there to participate in the Greek uh, industry of tourism. Yeah, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Alex, was there anything that I didn't ask about or anything else that you want to mention? I just want to mention that uh, now it's really the high point of uh, resistance. And uh, in August, I think we will see a lot of uh, things, bad and good, like uh, repression, but also a lot of fight back. And uh, from September, I don't know how Exarchia will uh, look like, (laughs) what will be happening. And yeah, that people can uh, follow our uh, media and get informed and of course uh, we are open to uh, exchange ideas with other people on gentrification or to connect struggles uh, around the world because of course this thing that happens here is it's happening everywhere as as you you said before and also with uh, uh, Atlanta forest occupation uh, I think it was very important to uh, learn about it uh, in the defense of uh, our hill and we can find a lot of uh, common things and get empowered from this struggle yes and I, I really hope we we can win and we can uh, spread some uh, solidarity uh, to your struggles and to other struggles uh, around the globe yes <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much for taking the time to have this Thank conversation. You very much. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. I hope you have a good day. And- <laughs> Thanks. You too. <laughs> Tune in next week for our interview with Raymond Crabe, author of Adventure Capitalism, about right wing libertarian exit strategies, settler colonialism, the oxymoronic anarcho capitalists, and much more. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. On Thursday, a Russian judge gave WNBA All-Star Brittany Griner a sentence of nine years for smuggling drugs into Russia. Griner has been locked up in Russia for several months after getting stopped at customs on her way into the country with vaping canisters of hashish oil in her luggage. She has pled guilty to drug smuggling charges, though she has contended all along that she had accidentally packed the canisters and that she never intended to break Russian laws. Everyone old enough to remember the Cold War before the Berlin Wall fell will be accustomed to Russian judges giving out nines to American athletes. But this nine is a lot more devastating. Brittany Griner was also given a fine of a million rubles. In American money, that's like a $25 Walmart gift card. The fine aside, it seems pretty harsh to hand out nine years for hashish oil, clearly intended for personal use. I've never used hashish oil myself, but I smoked hash once. I was laying down guitar tracks on a four-track and went looking to borrow a guy's bass. 
I didn't find him, but his brother gave me a pipe that looked like it was filled with green sponge you buy at Meyer to stick in the potted plants. I took a couple deep hits and went back to laying down tracks. It was the greatest lead work I had ever done in my life, and I played for hours. The next day I hit the playback and was deeply disappointed. It sounded like a donkey pulling a French ambulance over a herd of alley cats. Nothing but shrill, incoherent screeching. So, if you want to enhance your musical abilities, get a lot of hash and give it to everyone listening to you. I can't say whether the hashish oil improves your basketball skills because I don't really have any. But if Brittany Griner is any indication, um, just say yes. But you know what? Whatever the offense or circumstances, if Brittany Griner were a male NBA player, if she were LeBron James or Kevin Durant, she'd be home right now. The U.S. would have arranged her release as a top priority. In the last round of negotiations, they got that white dude home and left Brittany Griner in the gulag. Now they're pairing up talks about Brittany Griner with a white guy named Paul Whelan. Heard about this guy? The Russians say he's a spy, and who knows, he very well might be. Whelan is a former Marine. He was discharged for bad conduct after getting court-martialed for attempted larceny. Now, let's unpack that. The guy was a Marine. As a Marine, he tried to steal something and got caught. So he was a Marine, but not a good one, and was a thief, but not a good one. And now the Russians claim he was a spy, but not a good one. I think I see a pattern with that guy. Do we need him back? I just can't figure out why Brittany Griner isn't important all on her own. Why a U.S. administration that has a woman of color as the VP can't just focus on the repatriation of this woman of color. Why do they constantly have to be working on getting back Brittany and a white guy? and then Brittany and another white guy, and have more success getting back the white guys. I'm also disappointed to see so little disruption. After the killing of George Floyd, the WNBA players walked off the court before their male counterparts. The male players followed. I would like to see more talk in both leagues about postponing the start of the upcoming seasons until Brittany Griner is returned. That would incentivize both leagues into devoting resources and opening considerable channels of communications in order to help getting her back. Threatening profit margins will always get attention to a problem. There seems to be widespread consensus in the U.S. that Brittany Griner's captivity is a political ploy, just more cynical gamesmanship on the part of the Russians. In the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I suppose that's an easy conclusion. But that's also very myopic. I would suggest that the Russians' invasion was at least partly provoked by the U.S. courting former Eastern Bloc countries and trying to pull them into NATO, something the U.S. expressly promised not to do when the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviets engaged Glasnost and Perestroika. So it's easy to waggle that finger at the Russians, but just saying, for every finger the U.S. points at Russia, four are pointing back at the U.S. So since the U.S. is just as much to blame as the Russians for this hot mess, they need to get Brittany Griner home. There's speculation that the Russians are holding out for a sweeter deal. They don't want to give up Brittany and Paul Whelan and only get one Russian prisoner in the swap. If that's the case, then the U.S. ought to give back to the Russian government as many Russians as they want. Black lives matter. Certainly Brittany Griner's life is worth a handful of Russian dudes clogging up the American prisons, right? The Russians can keep the hashish oil. It may even help Vladimir Putin mellow out a little. But they need to send Brittany Griner home. And that means the U.S. has to really start making plans for how to get her here. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Maxi Multimax in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance.
You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. Three two zero five, OSP Youngstown, eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. Psst, you can cash app. Dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send Dota to us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at, at Swainiac 1969 or Twitter at, at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.